Luke chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 14 and closing with a couple of thoughts found in verses 17 through 19. As we simply remember the Christmas story. I was talking to my uh, grandson and my granddaughter, um, Josiah and uh, Sophie, yesterday. And Sophie was real excited because she's six years old. I guess at six you can be excited about all kinds of things. And she was real excited because her mama was going to let them open their presents um, early. And, and I'm telling you, that little girl was very excited about doing that. And, uh, and so Josiah and I and Sophie were having a, a visit, a grandpa time, if you will. And, uh, and I, I turned to my little girl, my, my baby girl, and I said to her, you're real excited about opening up your presents, aren't you? And she says, oh, yes, Papa, I'm really excited. I said, as you should be. Uh, it, it's a lot of fun to do that, baby doll. I said, let me ask you a question about your presents. And she said, yes, what? I said, which one of them will last forever? Which one? And um, Josiah is 10 years old, and so he's seated there, and, and um, you know, he says, well, none of them do. I said, Sophia, how many of them last forever? And which one of them that you open is going to be the one that will be the very best for all time? And she doesn't understand, she's six years old, but I said, let me ask a question in a different way. I said, because I want you to be happy about your presence and all of that, but I'd like you to also think of something else. I'd like you to think about what matters. And so, Josiah, what matters in this world? What really matters? I'll, I'll say it differently, I said, and I looked at him, because he's a little stinker, he can, he can tease with me, he teases with me all the time. I said, no, I'm being serious, and he goes, I go, what would you prefer, a new uh, a PS4, because he's really into electronics, or your papa? Which one would you want the most? And you better answer right, because I do have the power to kill you. <laughs> he starts to laugh, and he says, oh, the PS4, papa, of course, that would be the best thing to have. I said, really, is that really what you think? He says, of course not. He says, the most important thing to me will always be you, you. And I said, Sophie, I said, that's the whole thing. I want you to learn at an early age that things do not matter, but people do. Things do not matter because things get old. They get used up. They're thrown away. But people and relationships they last. And the most important thing that you need to have is not a new toy, but you need to value the things that matter. The Lord Jesus Christ, your family, these are the things that matter. Because I promise you, if you were wandering in a desert and you were about to die of thirst and you happened upon a pirate's chest, we'll say somehow it got in the desert, a chest of gold, and you opened it up, hoping that you would find water, and all you found was gold, you would throw the gold away and say, what use is this to me? This will not give me life. And the problem that we have today, I think, that is really being exacerbated by our materialism and our secularism, is we are trying to find eternal value in things that perish. And so the Christmas story that we look at is not simply a story, it is not a myth, it is not a fable, it is a fact. And the whole point of the story is that God has seen us in our great need and has met that great need through a person, Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 6, reading to verse 14. I'll begin at verse 6. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. 
Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. In verse 17, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary and Joseph, as the passage here before us would state had we read it from verse 1, have traveled from the north, northern town of Nazareth, a small village really that didn't have a population of very many. Some estimate that during the time of the birth of Christ, the city of Nazareth may have, have had as few as, as 60 people, no more than 200 in that small community. So Mary and Joseph had left this small community in place up to the north, and they had traveled south just a little past the city of Jerusalem, to a city called Bethlehem. And while they were there, as the scripture says, they tried to secure a, a room uh, in a home uh, or, a, or what we would call an inn or a hotel, but there was no room for them. And so even as we begin to look at what's taking place here, we need to think in terms of what's going on. And, and in Mary's moment of giving birth, there she is, and she's without any assistance. There's no other woman with her to help her, it's not mentioned at least in the passage, and certainly she had no midwife. But there she is as she's bringing forth, as it says in verse 7, her firstborn son, and she's wrapping him, notice with me, in swaddling cloths. Which is interesting because we'll look at this again in a moment, but in verse 7 it speaks of swaddling cloths, and then again in verse 12 it says, this will be the sign to you, you'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. So she's wrapping the Lord Jesus Christ as was normal in what were called swaddling cloths. And she's laying him in this manger with her own hands. I was reading concerning swaddling cloths just to get an idea of what this would mean. And, and uh, one of the writers mentioned when a child was born, it was wrapped in swaddling clothes after being washed gently with water, having a small portion of salt in it. The salt symbolized the qualities of truth and honesty and was used so that the child would grow up speaking words that were salted. The swaddling clothes were narrow strips of fine linen cloth about two to four inches wide and up to 15 to 20 feet in length, which was wrapped around the baby's body. The child was wrapped from head to foot with only part of his face left uncovered so he could breathe. The baby's body and limbs were thus held very straight, indicating that he would grow up to be free from crookedness and waywardness and would walk straight and tall before the people. The swaddling cloths were left on the baby for only a short time while the parents took time to pray and make their commitment to God concerning the upbringing of the child. Now interestingly, these same strips of cloth were used to wrap the limbs of babies, but also used for wrapping the bodies of the dead. And so from the very beginning, Jesus' birth is prefiguring his death. And that's why he would be referred to as the one who was born as a savior in this passage. Now, in the midst of her pain, and undoubtedly in the midst of any embarrassment that she would have, there would be joy. We need to remember that Joseph and she had had no physical intimacy whatsoever. And there's Joseph undoubtedly attending the birth of this child. But Mary has never been seen in that fashion before. There has to be some embarrassment. But in the midst of that, there's joy. It's like what Jesus said in John 16, 21. A woman, when she's in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a man has been born into the world. And those of us who are parents can say, absolutely, we understand that. Because my wife giving birth to four children, I can tell you that... that uh, there's never been so much suffering as, as I suffered when she gave birth. <laughs> no, watching her. Watching her and saying, thank you, Jesus, I was not born a woman. I'll never forget that. I remember the fourth child, Anna, when Anna was born, was being born. In the middle of her birth pains, Marie would look at me with a very firm, stern face. She even gritted her teeth 
And she said it several times. She said, this is the last one. <laughs> this is the last one. And I'm just kind of like, yeah, whatever you say, baby, that's fine with me. This is the last one. Okay, all right, man. Guacamole was coming out of her mouth. Her head was spinning. It was really amazing. It really was. <laughs> this is the last one. But the minute that baby was born, the minute that baby was placed in her arms, and she looked at them, all four of them, there was this entire change of demeanor, this entire change of, of mentality, because a child had been born, and she got to hold that baby that was hers. And that's what Jesus speaks about. So there's time of pain, no doubt, and there was time more than likely of, of embarrassment. But the moment that baby was born, there was joy. And notice what it says in verse 7. She brought forth her firstborn son. Now in Luke, in chapter 1, when uh, Mary was speaking to the angel, the angel said to her, it's found in verses uh, 30 through 33, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. So she brought forth her firstborn. And notice how it says in verse 7, she laid him in a manger. The, the manger is where the animals would feed. And uh, just for a moment, if you've ever been around a feeding trough, you can know how disgustingly dirty that really would be. It was filthy. All around this manger area would be dung. And so the fact that he was placed in a manger surrounded by dung is intended to not just be a historic reference, but to remind us that Jesus Christ had humility. Someone wrote he was placed in a manger that people who, who act like beasts might partake of the bread of life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Paul said it like this. He said, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now it says in verse 7, there was no room for them in the inn. When you do your studies, you'll discover that there are two words that are translated by the single word inn. One word speaks of what would be called a hostel or a hotel. But the other speaks of an enclosure. This enclosure is a place where the travelers would drive their cattle for the night. And this particular inn had water supplied, but there was no host, there was no food, there were no ordinary comforts. It wasn't a hotel with a stable outside. Actually, what it was was a stable. And so the point that is being made here by Luke is there wasn't even room for Mary in the stable. Mary gave birth to Jesus outside of the stable, more than likely in the cool of the evening. We know that Bethlehem was crowded because of the census. We know that Mary was in an unoccupied corner of a courtyard where it was dirty, it was smelly. It was occupied by horses and mules and camels, not to mention the unwanted intrusion of strangers. But as this is taking place, notice verse 8, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, and they were keeping watch over their flock by night. And so as this is taking place, heaven responds, there are ordinary temple shepherds. They're given a, what would be called a heavenly birth announcement. It's possible that these were shepherds who were keeping the sheep that would be used as offerings. And that then would help us to see the picture of Jesus Christ because Jesus is, Jesus is the sin offering to God. Even as it says in John 1, where it says, uh, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So from his beginning, we see humility. We also see that he is an offering. Now, these shepherds, interestingly enough, would, would really represent mankind because they were a despised class, because they were not able to keep the, 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 the fullness of the law. They normally weren't even schooled in the law of Moses. And, and many people looked at these shepherds rather as being ignorant. Now, they're performing their ordinary task of watching over sheep. They would keep an eye on them in three-hour shifts. They protected them against the predators and against thieves. And it was to these shepherds that the heavenly birth announcement was given. They were ordinary, working-class people, but they received great news, just the way that we are. Ordinary, working-class people, majority of us. 
And yet God has broken through in our jobs, into our lives, and has given to us the great news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice in verse 9, it says, An angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. This is how the Lord normally works in the ordinary events of our lives. The extraordinary can occur. Because I've discovered that God invades the ordinary. We need to remember that there had been 400 years of silence. The closing of the book of Malachi had occurred 400 years earlier. The 39 books of the Old Testament had been sealed. There had been no voice from God, no prophetic word for 400 years. Four centuries of silence. But now that silence is broken and God's giving a, a birth announcement through the angels. And at the right time, as God always works in the right time, God began to work amongst men. It says in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And what do they say? Verse 10, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. You live in a world that's lacking, lacking joy. You live in a world that is under oppression and has been for years. What do I sense going on right now in the lives of people as a minister of the gospel, as a pastor of a church? Two words come to mind. And I sense this with a lot of you, the youth. I think it's in general, frankly. Two words. Loneliness and anger. Those are two words that seem to combine to describe many of the young people that I know. And I'm not talking about those in their 20s and 30s. I'm talking about those who are 5 and 10 and 15 years old. I'm talking in general of, of younger people. And I see that. I see that there are a lot of reasons. You can insert your own. But there are a lot of reasons that that, that is apparently true. It would seem that it is true. There are a lot of lonely people. And there are a lot of angry people. And the loneliness and the anger seems to be combining to just a sullenness and a, an attitude of, I need to get it for myself, whatever it is out there that there is that's available, I need to make sure that I get my portion of that. Loneliness and anger. And, and the funny thing about that is that was true of every generation. It was true of mine. If you'd have asked me what are the two basic things that you feel at the age of 20 just before I got saved, if I'd have boiled it down, I'd have said there are two things that I feel. I'm angry. And I'm lonely. I'm angry because it doesn't seem like life is, is dishing out to me the things that I would like it to. I'm lonely. I don't have a relationship with anybody that could help me to feel anything that is valuable. I had this attitude of just being unloved and unwanted. And that made me an angry young man. And I think that there are a lot of people like that today. An awful lot of people. And, and at the root of it is because I was trying to find a purpose in life through relationships, and I felt that I deserved more than I had gotten in life. And after getting saved, the Lord gave me something I've never forgotten. He said, the only thing that I've ever owed you is judgment, but I have given you my grace. And that changed my entire way of thinking. Because when it's all said and done, when people say, well, how can bad things happen to good people? That's because they're failing to realize that there's none good, no, not one. And that there's only been one good person on the face of the earth who's ever lived, and that was Jesus Christ. And when we begin to wonder about how bad things can happen to good people, we need to act, actually ask ourselves, how come bad happened to that good person? Because... Not everything that I go through is simply because I'm reaping what I sow. There are some things that are thrust upon me that I really didn't have any control over in the sense of asking for it. But much of what I've gone through has been simply because I sowed certain seeds and I reaped the harvest of my behavior. 
And a lot of the things that I found to be hurtful to me were simply repercussions of decisions I had made and the results of those decisions to the point where I began to, reaping what, to begin reaping what I was sowing. And in many ways, because I had high expectations on, on, we'll say, relationships, I would drive away the person that I wanted to be in my life the most. And then the result of that would be my anger, which I would bring into a new relationship because I was expecting to be losing that one too. And it wasn't until I came to realize that, that I, I had a deeper problem than just the loneliness I was feeling and the anger as a result of that. My deeper problem was the fact that that I was a lost individual and I was sinful and I was simply reaping what I was sowing in life. And so when God breaks into your life, there's an awareness, an awakening, and it takes him to do that. And so in a world that was lacking in joy, in a world that was under great oppression for hundreds of years, the Lord says, I'm bringing you good news, and this is news that is good for all people. It's like what it says in Isaiah 52, 10, the Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And he says in verse 11, for there is born to you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. City of David is the name for the city of Bethlehem where David was born. It was his city. And he says for you, there is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, Messiah. This day signals the dawn of a new day. Man had been living in darkness, but now that darkness is being driven away by the light. And there is one who has been born. He is first a Savior. When he says he's a Savior, this is the one who's confronting all the sin of the world. And this is the one who rescues us. There has been born the one who will conquer, the one who will rule. Like it says in Colossians 2.15, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. But he says also he is Christ the Lord. The word Christ, Christos, means the anointed one. The name points out the Savior of the world in a prophetic royal and priestly office. Prophets and priests and kings would be anointed with oil when installed into their offices. And Jesus is the anointed. But he is also the Lord. And this one who is the Lord, the Savior, has been born for us. And indeed, he says those are great tidings. That's good tidings. And it produces great joy. It's for all people. And this, he says in verse 12, will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. A babe in swaddling cloths. You will find this glorious person, however strange it may appear, wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a stable. It is by humility that Christ comes to reign. And this is the only way into his kingdom. Pride is the character of all the children of Adam. Humility, the mark of the Son of God and all of his followers. Christ came in the way of humility to destroy that pride, which is the root of evil in the soul's of men. Christ, wrapped in swaddling cloths, prefiguring his death, lying in a manger, placed where animals feed. And as this is taking place, before they could react, the choir bursts out in praise and says, glory to God in the highest and peace unto men. In a moment of time, we receive understanding that should change our entire lives. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men occurs when God is given the glory there is no peace on earth except among those with whom God is well pleased. The Bible makes it clear that men are in a state of hostility with heaven and it spills over to our relationships with one another. The carnal mind, the Bible says, is enmity against God and the one who sins wars against his maker. So when men become reconciled to God through the death of his son, men can actually change and we can actually begin to love one another. We can have peace with God because God is the God of peace. We can have peace in our own conscience, and we can have peace with our neighbors. And goodwill will dwell amongst us, and we can be known by the good works that we perform on behalf of the Lord in his glory. When it says, and I'll close with a couple of thoughts in verse 17, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds, but Mary kept all the things that, and pondered them in her heart. A couple of things that we want to consider is this. One, Mary pondered these things. 
she thought about what this would mean. How is it that she should bear the Son of God? And how is it that God would have a heavenly choir, if you will, announcing birth the Son of God? And what is this going to mean in the future in that he was placed in a manger wrapped in swaddling cloths, which would be a prefigurement of the fact that one day he'd be placed on a cross and afterwards taken and wrapped once again? What does this really mean? And as she thought through that, we see something else. We see the sharing of this event. Because it says in verse 17, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And in verse 20, the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. Here's a couple things for you. One, if you want to be a witness, what are you witnessing to? What you're witnessing to is Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of the world. That's what we witness. Jesus Christ born, Jesus Christ living, Jesus Christ dying, Jesus being buried, Jesus being resurrected, Jesus ascending to heaven, Jesus sending the Holy Spirit to dwell within us and us awaiting his return while we serve him. And what do we do as we ponder on these things is we prepare our hearts through the study and meditation on the word of God so that we might share these things with other people. What the Lord would have us to do is one, first and foremost, ponder on the things of what Jesus Christ is and who he, who he is and what he has done. When you have a deep relationship with the Lord concerning those things, now you're able to share things concerning him. That's why we spend time reading the word of God. That's why we meditate on the things of God. That's why we, we understand that the Lord Jesus Christ is a savior. That's why we understand that we needed him to transform our lives. That's why we, we, we think about what we've been and rejoice in what we're becoming. Because that gives to us a depth that we can share from personal experience. And these shepherds had an amazing experience and they were able to speak concerning it. We have heard an announcement. We have seen the babe. He was there in the manger. And we understand this and we'll speak concerning this because he's been born to be the savior of the world. And that's what we do. See, Christmas as we gather here today is simply to remember what we're all about. There's no reason to gather on Christmas Day if this is not true. But it is true. And so we're going to be leaving here in a moment. We're going to go to our homes and perhaps the families or other locations, and we're going to be with them. And we're going to have opportunity to be a light, sometimes in a dark place. We're going to have an opportunity to, to if God gives us opportunity, to share, to speak concerning the goodness of the Lord. You may be there at the table, and you may be with your family, and your family may not be a religious-type family, but they know you are, and they may look at you, and they may say to you, you want to pray? And uh, what an opportunity it will be for you to pray and to bless the Lord for the food. Just make sure that you don't give a 25-minute prayer while you're doing it. You know, oh, Lord, save all the sinners like Grandpa to my right and my mom, you know, when she's such a drunk, you know. I mean, you don't want to do that. But you'll be given opportunities. You know that it happens all the time. You're going to encounter the, the miserable cousin or uncle who's so mad about life and doesn't get any breaks. If you go to your family, you will encounter some sorrow. You will. We always do. It's in our homes, isn't it? It's in our families. But we have the answer, don't we? We have the answer. We have the answer. They may not understand it right now, but they're watching you. You are a living Bible. You are known and you are read by all men. They watch your life. They hear you. They watch you when you're with the children. They, they watch you when you're there at, uh, watching the game. They, they watch you. They notice you. I'm not saying that they're that there's just, you know, everybody's eyes on you everywhere you go. You know, I don't want you to be paranoid when you walk out. But, but, they, but they are noticing you. That's what got my dad saved. That's how my dad was saved. Because when I shared with my father about the gospel and I told him he needed the Lord and I didn't want to go to heaven without him, later on he spoke to me and he said, you know, he said, when you shared with me about the Lord Jesus Christ, when you shared with me that I needed Jesus, and when you told me, that I was going to go to hell, he said, I wanted to get up and hit you when you said that. He said, but when you said to me, when you said to me, Daddy, I love you, and I don't want to go to heaven without you, he said, that spoke to my heart. He said, and David, he, get, he goes, Madeline, your sister, had given her heart to Christ. And Madeline, as far as my dad was concerned, was a perfect daughter. My sister Madeline when other kids at 16, 17 years old, 15 years old were going out, when they were going out and partying and doing the things that they did, 
when she was 16 years old, when she had her license, she could have been doing that. At that age, my sister Madeline would stay home on Friday night, stay home on Saturday. She didn't ever go out. My sister Madeline didn't party. She didn't drink. She didn't get in any trouble. She was a good student. She was a great, and as far as our family was concerned as a little teenager, she was the perfect daughter. She was the kind of daughter that every father would like to raise. No problems at all. I would come home, and she would be seated between my mom and my dad with a bowl of popcorn in her hair in curlers, and she'd be eating popcorn with them watching TV. And that would be on Friday and Saturday. And I'd be thinking, man, get a life. Go out and get drunk. I mean, do something. So my dad says to me, he goes, he said, when you got saved, he goes, I knew you needed God. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. He goes, but when your sister Madeline got saved, that was different. He goes, because... He says, I knew I was better than you, but I was not better than her. And having that little girl in my house and her saying she needs a Savior, Jesus, combined with the evil of your life and the changes that I saw take place in you, those two things combined over those three weeks for me to say there is a God who changes lives and I'm a sinner in need of a savior. That's how my dad got saved. It wasn't simply me saying to him, Dad, this is the word of God speaking to you. You're a good man. You're the best man I'll ever know, but you'll be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. That was a little bold for me to say, but it was true. There was no lie in that. Daddy, you're a good man. My dad was a good man. My dad would get up at the same time Monday through Friday. I had a good father. He'd go to work at 6.30. He'd work a full day. He'd come home every day at 7 o'clock. My dad would be home between 7 and 7.05 every day of my life. He only came home late one time that I can remember in my whole young life. On Saturday, he mowed the lawn. On Sunday, he'd kind of hang around the house. And that was my dad. I never had to worry about my dad ever looking at another woman. My dad never did. My dad had eyes for only one woman. I saw that my whole life. My dad was faithful, and my dad was true. My dad was a hard worker and a very good man. My dad was honest. My dad paid his bills on time. My dad would, would pay his bills before he bought groceries for us because he wanted spotless credit, and he taught me that same work ethic. Pay your bills and then take care of your family. It's what my dad did. And yeah, there were times when he didn't have enough for both. So what we'd do is we'd have a meal on a Monday that we shared on Tuesday and sometimes into Wednesday. And we learned to eat things my mom used to call it, like weenie soup. <laughs> All it was was a can of tomato sauce and a couple of potatoes that were cut up in some frankfurters that she dropped into it. And that was our soup and that was our dinner. But that was good because my dad was working, providing income. When it was Christmas, I can still remember my mom taking my brother and me into the front room. And there was a little tree and some presents. And my mom said, Santa Claus didn't bring you these. You want to see Santa Claus? She pointed at my father, that's Santa Claus. And you ought to thank Santa Claus for bringing you these presents. That's what my mom would do. Yeah, you know, that was my mom, you know. And so she taught us that my father was a good man. My mom, in my entire life, I cannot remember my mom, as I was growing up specifically, ever saying a bad thing about my father to me. My mom used to say, your dad is a good man. And my mom taught me my dad was a perfect man. I wonder how many wives in this room could say that kind of thing. That's how my mom was. My mom never sat down during dinner. My mom always stood up. She was always by the, by the kitchen sink with her plate. And if my dad even looked like he wanted something more, the first thing my mom would say is, honey, do you need something else? My mom always would serve my dad before she served us. And if we were hungry, my mom would say, that's too bad you can eat a carrot because your dad's going to get the meal. That's how it was in my home. My dad was a good man, and that's why it took such nerve for this, this kid just a few weeks before was a, a doper and an alcoholic. 
I wouldn't work a job. I used to climb into the back of dumpsters at gas stations to take out tires that would fit on my car, and I would take them to a friend of mine. I'd say, I've got some low rubber on my tires here. Would you put these tires on my car for me? And he'd put them on because he worked at a gas station. I didn't work a job. I wouldn't work. All I did was smoke pot, drink, and party. That's all I did until I was 20 years old. And here I am, this little jerk of a boy with long hair, barefooted, wild-eyed, big old sideburns and granny glasses, sitting with a Bible, spouting Bible to my dad. My dad didn't like the Bible. My dad said, the only person I ever knew who read a Bible was crazy, so I want no Bibles in my house. But when he watched me change and he saw my sister's need, my dad came to faith in Jesus Christ. You are a living letter known and read by all men. Do not forget the power of your testimony. And as you go to be with your family today, remember who you are. You represent the kingdom of God. You have a savior. His name is Jesus. He transformed your life. Remember that. Because that's what it's all about. That's, all, that's what it's all about. A savior has been born. Not a prophet. Not a teacher not even a king, but a savior. And we sinners need this savior.